the next time, the uh, next event has already been set. The end of the world is coming. And that's what I want to tell you about. I want to take you back to the original prophecy of the coming of the Lord, of the end of this age. Those that have come after him have all proved themselves to be false. But there is one true prophecy. This, this age is coming to an end. One day time will be no more. You know, it... it it set the whole world on edge, I guess, maybe uh, for our generation um, as, as we looked at the, the different predictions that was made. You know, there was the Y2K scare, and, and we've had several, I, I can't even tell you how many uh, predictions that have been given since then about the end of the world. Um, you know, the 2012 thing was big because the Mayans knew everything. You know, and they, writ, they wrote this, I was going to say they writ this. They wrote this about, I don't know, you know, five billion years ago or something. And, and uh, they were so accurate with everything they'd done, they had to be right on. So, you know, everybody put a lot of stock, not everybody, a lot of folks put a lot of stock in what they had to say. And I got to tell you that just 2,000 years ago, the one that really does know everything and has never failed in a, a prophecy or a prediction, as you might like to call it, Never failed in not one single, not even in a prediction or a prophecy, but not even one part, not even a, a particular detail of a prophecy has been left undone as it has come to pass. And he prophesied that the end of time would come. And I just want you to know that just because there's a lot of naysayers out there, the whole idea of counterfeits just go to prove that there is a real thing. Amen. Wouldn't be no need for a counterfeit $100 bill if there wasn't a real one. Amen. And the whole idea behind folks that are making false prophecies just go to say there is a true one. And I want to talk to you about the true one tonight. Uh, and the... Let, let me just clarify that because I want to... I want It just might tie in a little bit with what I want what I, Spoke to you on this morning when I said about faith. Remember, faith was putting our trust in a person, not in the events or the circumstances, that type of thing. You might say to me, Brother Buddy, how do you know that Jesus' prophecy is the actual true and literal prophecy? How do you know it's not just another one of the false ones? My answer to you would be this. Not because I have, not, not because I have such great wisdom that I understand and know that his calendar worked out right the, the reason is is because I have absolute confidence in him he's the one well somebody's upset somebody just can't get happy that did it that did it Holly what I want to do every time a, a member gets upset I'm going to send them to you and you just you start whining come on Frank Every time. Hey, because babies come in all sizes. I need to get back to preaching, don't I? I hear you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. In Matthew chapter 24, by the way, and I, I say this for you scholars that are out there, I know there's a lot of people uh, that, uh, that say that uh, passages out of Matthew have nothing to do with the rapture, and I'm okay with that. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to share with you that I know the time of the end is coming. Okay, listen. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, there were so many people quoting me that scripture whenever we was coming up on December the 21st. You know, everybody was saying, well, they, 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 nobody knows. And, uh, but uh, they, they kept saying that to try to give credibility to the fact that we couldn't know the day and that this person that had made the prediction was false or the Mayans couldn't predict. But I want you to recognize it didn't stop 
when it said, no man knoweth the hour, not the angels of heaven, but it goes, but my father only. So there, that it goes to show that there is a time and there is somebody that knows the time. So don't just go around saying, well, the Bible says no man can know the time. Yeah, I know it says that no man can know, but it doesn't mean that there's not a set time. And it doesn't mean that nobody knows the time because he does. And he's going to share that with us. He goes on to say, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not, and knew not, didn't have any clue until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I want to stop there for a second. Verse 39. Now he said, starting in verse 37, but as the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. They were eating and drinking, getting into marriage, and having a good celebration in time. They... I want you to think about the days of Noah. Did they have any preaching about the end of time? Absolutely. Did, did, did they have anybody trying to warn them that destruction was coming? Absolutely. Uh, so, so what these scriptures are really saying to us is that the time of the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be likened to the time of Noah in the respect that folks' attitudes toward the preaching of the gospel will be like it was in the days of Noah. That's right. Amen. Not just the fact that folks are eating and drinking and marrying and giving a marriage, but the fact that they're doing it in the face of the prediction and the prophecy that the Lord is soon to return and that one day you got to stand before him. Folks live their lives as though, as if this is all there is to it and they'll be here forever. People turn, and for the most part, people turn a deaf ear to the warnings of things spiritual so that they may fulfill the things of the flesh. And they go about trying to drown out the message of the gospel that might bring some conviction to them by loading and overloading themselves with sensual things. Things of this world that bring pleasure to them. And they, they indulge even the more so. When we read the scripture says that they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving and marriage, that don't sound like that's too big a difference of just <coughs> from daily activity. But the emphasis is on the fact that in the face of impending danger, If you knew the end of your life was imminent, if you were uh, within a reasonable time frame of the loss of your life, would you go about life as normal? Or do you think there'd be some changes? Of course there'd be some changes. They carried on life as if there'd be no end. That's my point. And he said, just like it was in Noah's day when they when they mocked and they scorned the prophet of God, not only did they disbelieve the message of the impending judgment, they mocked the messenger. Imagine for all of the years that Noah preached the gospel, seeking to help people find grace in the eyes of God, to find mercy and to escape his judgment. And what did they do? They drowned his message with inc by increasing their earthly activities as if their lives would extend forevermore on this earth. Never have to face judgment. And mocked, mocked the man of God. Leaving themselves to be just purely sensual beings. <coughs> In this scripture, Jesus is informing us. Thank you, Lord. In this scripture, Jesus is informing us is that it's the attitude of the people that we have to focus on. 
that, what, that, that when we see that type of cynicism, when we see it where, where people um, not only, and I, if you ever come to an age, if we ever come to an age in this nation to where uh, righteousness is considered, is considered uh, uh, unrighteousness, and unholiness is actually considered holiness. When right is wrong and wrong is right, if we ever get to the place where somebody who tries to take a stand for morality and common sense and, and godliness is ever mocked or ridiculed by uh, public uh, speakers or, or, um, or, or the media or the government, or if we ever come to a place where, where folks who try to take a stand for what is right and try to get righteousness uh, legislated somehow, if we ever get to a place that that is the norm, we're in trouble. I think we're in trouble, don't you think, amen? You're exactly right. I mean, I knew that had to be ringing a bell with you when I was saying it. We're to that place now. You can watch any, you can watch any programming you want, and if it happens to have a, a, a character on there that is somewhat religious, that character is demeaned in such a way they, they seem to be the village idiot. Mocked and scored. And the Bible becomes treated like some book of myths or some fairy tales. No seriousness ever attached to it whatsoever. You, you can look in our political system and when somebody claims to be a child of God, it's not because they have sincere convictions about things in their life. It's because they're trying to win the vote of the conservative right. They want preachers to stand up and support them in the pulpits. I almost fell into that trap. <coughs> I don't like to support any particular candidate publicly from the pulpit. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. What I found is, is that we attended, my wife and I went to Orlando to attend a, uh, it was supposed to be a pastor's, I don't remember what they called it exactly, but it ended up being a pastor's political conference type thing and Renowned speakers from all over, everywhere come in. Uh, we had John Hagee and we had uh, Mike Huckabee and uh, I can't even not name all the guys that showed up and gave their speeches and David Barton, I don't know if you guys know him or not, but a lot of really famous guys showed up and began to speak to us and talked about the power of the preachers in the pulpit to help motivate change. And, and what I began to discover was all they were doing was using their influence. They were using keywords. And, and, and trying to speak about specific issues that they knew were near and dear to us to draw us over to their side. But it was all a bait and switch type of a thing. Amen. That's a political agenda. You're exactly right. They were no better than the other side. Yeah. I'm just telling you the truth. The truth is the truth and I'm just telling you. And, 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 I, and I'm finding that in the day and age in which we live, they take, they take um, uh, lightly the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the call of a Christian. Listen, our name Christians comes from the idea of Jesus Christ. We're followers of the true and living Son of God. We're His disciples. We emulate Him in our lifestyle. We seek to be like Him in our morality, in our, in our living, in our doctrine. We want to follow His footsteps and they mock that by trying to um, manipulate and use Christian, the Christian, powerful Christian vote. And Christian leaders have fell into that hook, line, and sinker. Amen. We're living in the time of Noah's day. When society has adopted the same mindset that they had in the days of Noah. Look what it says. In the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, married, giving them marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now, you guys know that Noah entered into the ark a whole week before the flood came, right? 
They were partying the whole time. They were living their lives the whole time and knowing. And it says and knew not in verse 39, and they knew not. They had no clue that he was telling the truth. They had no idea that his prophecy was the true prophecy until the flood came. You know why? Because they were based on what they could see, hear, feel, and touch. They weren't operating. They had no idea. They had no spiritual prowess about them whatsoever to conceive any idea of God's promise by faith. This is what I want to share with you tonight. One of the things important that I want to get across to you. Listen to me. One day, everybody will be a believer. Do you hear me? One day, everybody will be a believer. One day, every knee shall bow. One day, every tongue shall confess. One day, every living soul in the universe will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But they didn't do it by faith. They waited till they saw it, touched it, felt it, tasted it. They, they waited till their senses showed them. They waited until the flood came and took them all the way. They knew not. They could not perceive. They could not receive through faith the message of the gospel. Folks today sit in churches just like this one. And hear the warning, the warning, the warning that Jesus is soon to return. And they keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. And they wait till they see the clouds roll back. At the time that they get ready to, <coughs> to make the change is the time when they've seen, when they've experienced, when they finally say, oh, it really is real. Too late. Too late. Get my point? They knew not until the flood came. After the flood came, did they know? Every one of them. How many of them was believers after the flood came? Amen. How many of them wished they'd have got on the boat? Hmm? How many mockers wish they'd have been supporters instead of mockers? How many of them wish that I wish I'd have fell down at his feet and asked God to forgive me for my sins when that man was preaching to me instead of turning my back and going and mocking him and, and indulging in my lust so that I could drown out his message? Every single one of them. There's not a single one of them that wouldn't have traded everything they had for just a few moments to go back a few days and find themselves back at the mercy of an almighty God instead of at the judgment of an almighty God. You know history will repeat itself. <coughs> Excuse me while I pop another one of these things. Oh Lord. <laughs> I, got, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Amen. Got it right here. I apologize for that interruption. We'll go. Yeah. Amen. Listen, we find that verse 39 says, they knew not till the flood came and took them all away, but they knew after. I want you to know that that's what we're talking about. The rest of that verse says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, what that's saying is that's, that's the way that the days of the coming of the Son of Man is going to be. But it also means that that's the way that the coming of the Son of Man will be. And the fact that as the flood came, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. Listen for a second. Even though they were warned about the flood, they had no... Opportunity to escape it if they did not take it by faith at the preaching of the gospel. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. 
The Son of Man shall come just like the flood came. It came as a surprise. I know it sounds weird for me to tell you that because Noah kept telling them for years. He kept telling them, the flood's coming, the flood's coming. And they didn't believe him. And you go, well, how could it be a surprise? The same way that the Son of Man, just the same way Jesus is going to return, it's going to surprise folks. And men have been preaching it for years and years and years and years and years. And people are going, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, yes, you did. They'll say, why? I, why didn't I hear? Why didn't I know? Why didn't somebody tell me? And the truth of the matter is you did. You chose to reject it. You chose to label it as something that deserved mocking so that you continue, could continue with your lifestyle. Uh, hear me for a second. I don't want you to, for a second, because I, I know sometimes we can get really shouting up and go, ah, brother, God bless you, tell them all about it. We preach this inside the walls of the church. I'm, I'm talking to professed believers all over the sanctuary tonight. You got, I, I hope I'm getting your attention. I, I'm not screaming this out in a bar room somewhere. I'm not down to what they don't call them bar, the club. I ain't down to the club no more. <laughs> Change the name, I think it's okay, right? Yeah, listen, I'm not, I'm not down there. I'm, in the, I'm at the house of God, talking to God's people. And, and, I, and I'm telling God's people, listen, here's the warning. You know what sometimes professed God's people do? They shun it away. Me neither. I did for a while, though. I did. I did for a while. Then I thought one day, when I was sitting in back there somewhere, about where my mom's sitting, actually, in the pew, and I remember the conviction of God coming on my heart. And I thought that preacher was talking to only to me. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. Felt like I was the only person in the room. In fact, I felt like I was the only person in the world. I don't know why he kept talking to me. I thought there's a bunch of sinners in there. It wasn't me. He kept pointing to me. He kept talking. And I'll never forget the conviction that fell. And suddenly I discovered I couldn't just brush it off anymore. I needed to deal with it. Now I tried. I tried to roll it off. I went to the altar. I tried to do my religious activity. You know what? That's, that's one point I wanted to get to tonight. I tried to do a religious thing. I got up from my pew. I made my way to the altar, and I knelt, and I pretended to be in prayer. And that preacher wouldn't leave me alone. And he come and he spoke to me two times, in fact, interrupting my prayer, <coughs> which I wasn't doing, seeking to know what my condition was, concerned whether or not I knew Christ as personal Savior. We was in the church house. What did he think I was doing there if I wasn't saved? I was the preacher's kid. Didn't he know? I let song service talk. Didn't he know? Leave me alone. Concerned about my soul's condition. I was so glad he was. <laughs> We're pitiful, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to turn this over to somebody else. But notice what I did. I didn't get up and go out the door. I tried to hide in my religion. I'd been in church all my life. I knew how to do that. So I knelt at the altar. Nobody will bother you at the altar. It's a good, good place to hide, I thought. I had to get up from my seat because he's killing me. I thought I'll hide at the altar till the invitation's over. I keep my head down, mind my own business. When I hear the last amen, we go home. Dude don't know how to end the invitation. 
It seemed as though the weight of the world was upon me that day. And I struggled. I had been warned over and over and over again, yet I'm still trying to shun, shut out the true prophecy. Trying to turn off the conviction. Salve it over with my religion. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think I see it happen all the time in our church. I'm not trying to be judgmental towards you. I'm just telling you, I think it happens all the time. I preach messages sometimes and I can see your face. If you could just know. The Bible tells us that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And I, I, I oftentimes think I see right into some people's hearts. Uh, and it's remarkable to me. And I think, oh my gosh, they know. They know exactly. I'm talking to them. I can see it. There's, it's just a, you guys know what I'm talking about. I, I mean, it's locked right in. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to get the invitation. They're going to rip the pew apart getting down here. And then they, nobody comes. And I go, oh, my goodness. I am astonished. But yet we'll come back again the next week and we'll go over it all again. Now, tonight's message was about, like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming Son of Man, where folks were shunning the message of the truth indulging in their own lust to cover up that nagging conviction. And that message you would think should be talked to the world. But tonight we're talking it to the church house. We're preaching it to the, in the sanctuary to the, to the Lanny Road Baptist Church membership. And we're talking to you. Why? Is it possible that tonight that in our pews tonight, someone is still shielding themselves. Oh, God, I can't make eye. He's looking at me. I can't make eye contact. God, don't let him walk back this way. Oh, God. I wish that preacher would stay in the pulpit. I hate it when he comes down and looks right at me and then does his eyebrows. I hate it. A despiteful thing. And, and listen, uh, uh, the conviction gets covered up by our religious reaction or by the call of nature to go to the bathroom at just the wrong time. <coughs> How many times I've seen it? Somebody said to me, hey, but you know, I've got bad, bad prostate. I got to go. I said, go during the preaching. Don't wait till the invitation. Go during the preaching. Don't wait till the invitation. When God's seeking you to move, don't go that way. Never go that way. <coughs> Never run when God's calling. I think I'm about done. I had some more places I wanted to go, but he got all changed up on me. I got... I, we're living in that day. We could assign this to the world outside. I want to confine it to the world inside. I want to bring it, because listen, we're not going to change them out there till we get changed in here. Amen. Amen. We're not going to make an impact on the lives of those on the outside. To you and I, to you and I, get right and real with God. I sat in church for all of my life till I was 20 one years old, I was an old man. 21 years old, made professions of faith and had fooled everybody else into believing that I was saved. Going through all the motions, doing everything that everybody else did. I knew all the verbiage. I knew how to dress. Some folks ain't learned that yet. I'm waiting. Amen. 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 I, 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 knew how to do, I knew how to do all the things. And I participated in all the activities. And I was, I was right there in all of them, man. I'm telling you. I, if anybody was going to get in, I was going to get in. But I had no relationship with Jesus Christ. 
I had used all of those things to shield myself from the truth of the gospel. My wife shared the same thing about her testimony. That even just until 10 years ago, nine years ago maybe, she come to know Christ as person and say, Brother Ray, you had the same issue in your life. I already called to preach, how about that? Brother Doug, that happened to you too, did it not? There's probably more in here that could say the same thing. Brother Buddy, I had surrendered. I, I had told everybody I had surrendered. I had lived my life. I had taught Sunday school. I'd go on visitation. I'd work at the church. I did everything. And all it was really doing was covering up the conviction that I heard that was in my ears. Amen. Trying to drown out what God was really wanting to speak to me. Can we just tone it all down for just a minute? Let's cut away all the fat. Let's think about just the leanness of the moment. The only thing that matters is do you know Christ as personal Savior? Is there a time in your life where you started a relationship and you know, you know that you've been eternally and intimately changed forevermore? Only you and God can know that. But I am totally convinced that you do know that. You may be covering it up. You may be in seeing the symptoms in your own life of the cover up. There's no spiritual fruit in your life. You don't have love, joy, peace. There's only the, uh, f the, the works of the flesh that come in through anger and malice. Those types of things, backbiting. You have, all, you have all those symptoms and you have none of the fruits of the Spirit. And you're very aware that there's something wrong. And this is what you normally do. You blame it on somebody else. The reason you're so unhappy is because your kids ain't acting right. Or your wife won't act right. Or your husband won't get right. Or your pastor, never mind about him. <laughs> You, you, you use everything in the world to blame. <clears throat> Don't have enough money. The bills are pressing on you. Everything in the world. And you use those excuses to talk about why you're so frustrated. But the truth of the matter is, it's a heart thing. It emanates not from without. It emanates from within. Amen. And it affects you in every part of your life. But yet you want to hold on. You want to hold on to the idea, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Guys, that won't stand up before God. It won't stand up before God. You must have a personal relationship. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. I'm going to ask uh, that they come and get a song ready. We do the whole song thing so we can kind of lull you. So it kind of identifies this is the time of response that we're expecting out of you. The reason they're singing a song, playing the music, is to set aside this time that says to you, you're being called now to make a response. The invitation is given to come. The response we're waiting on. And as long as the music plays and the song is sung, we'll wait. That's the reason they do that. Tonight, are you ready to receive that? Do you believe that he is coming again? Do you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt? Are you ready? You need to be ready. December 21st came and went, and gosh, I didn't lose any sleep. I, 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 you know, in fact, you know what some, I said to somebody when they told me about it? I said, they said, what do you think about that? I said, I hope they're right. I hope, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. Bless God, if that's it, that's the day I've been looking for. In fact, I hope he makes it on the 20th. I, I don't have a dread or a fear of that. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm excited about the fact of knowing Jesus is returning to take us home to be with him. Are you ready to go? December 21st was a false prophecy. Matthew 24 is a true prophecy. Would you stand with me today, please?